Don't anybody get upset because I'm used to people leaving when I get up to preach. <laughs> Thank you for the beautiful song and very well done. Uh, makes me... Um, <clears throat> We dropped our daughter off at college about three weeks ago, and my daughter and I would sing together occasionally, so that makes me miss singing with my daughter. Acts chapter 20 in your Bible, please, if you'll find that, Acts chapter 20. I want to speak to you this morning on the passions of a mission-focused church. If you were here Friday night, I introduced you to a statement that I wanted you to memorize, uh, eventually get it memorized, that, the, that God is on a mission to reveal His glory and extend His grace to every kindred, tribe, and tongue. God is on a mission to reveal His what? Glory and extend His grace to every kindred, tribe, and tongue. If that is the mission of God, then what do you suppose the church's work ought to be? Propagating the glory of God and the grace of God and His his saving gospel around this world. Amen right there? Some folks think that God gave us the Great Commission, the Lord gave us the Great Commission at the end of each gospel because he he finally decided he needed to give us something to occupy us with. Uh, Listen to this statement. You have to think this through now. Some people actually believe God gave the Great Commission to the church. But I want to tell you that God gave the church to the mission. The mission began in Genesis 1 when God began revealing himself in creation. Because Psalm 19 one says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. So God began revealing himself and extending his grace to Adam and Eve and to humanity all throughout the word of God. He began this mission in Genesis, and the church was established. Um, And I won't argue with you about when the church was officially established. But you have to know the church launched at Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came and empowered believers for the witness of the gospel. So God gave the church to his mission, which was already in existence from eternity past. Amen right there? Y'all don't think I'm a heretic now, do you? Okay, good, good. So I want us to look at the uh, farewell message of Paul to the church at Ephesus. He's going to be speaking here to the leaders of the church of Ephesus, and he's going to talk to them about the future of the church. I want to read two verses. Uh, Let me pray first. Lord Jesus, thank you for the opportunity to share your precious word this morning. I pray that you'll speak through your word to our hearts. May we be uh, dealt with directly and individually this morning, that your spirit, knowing our heart and our life and our our current status in this world, that that you would direct us deeper into your mission and this church as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Acts 20, verse 17, the Bible says, God is, uh, I'm I'm sorry, I started to read the slide up there. (laughs) That's not what the Bible says. Here's what the Bible says. (laughs) Acts 20, verse 17, and from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called the elders of the church. And when they were come to him, He said unto them, Ye know from the first day I came into Asia, after what manner I have been with you at all seasons. Now would you please keep your Bible open. I'm going to refer to more verses. We're going to go all the way down through verse 24 this morning. But I want you to see that Paul is referring back to his ministry among the leaders of Ephesus. He's referring to his own time serving with them. And and, uh, he's, he's going to teach them about the future of the church. Now, I I need to point out, I I feel like I should point out that he doesn't teach them about methodology. He doesn't teach them about how to build a big church. He doesn't teach them about how to draw a big crowd. But he's going to give them some passions that should govern their hearts and should govern their ministry that will fulfill the mission of God. So, these are very dear people to Paul. He probably led some of these men to the Lord. No doubt he nurtured them in the faith and trained them in the ministry. And and he stopped at Miletus on his way back to Jerusalem and called for them some 30 miles journey for them to come and visit with him here. And he's got one last opportunity to pour out his heart so that this church will know how to go forward without his leadership and without his personal presence and influence. Paul was successful not because he had good methods. 
I think if Paul were alive today, he would be the most sought after spiritual growth or church growth expert on, on the planet, don't you think? Because Paul could go someplace. He spent three years at Ephesus, but it, most places he just spent a few months. And he could go someplace and he could teach and train and leave and a church was planted and it grew. Paul would have been a very successful and was a very successful church planner. He would be a very successful church growth coach in our day to day. But he was not successful because he knew how to plant churches. He was successful because he was mission focused. He was mission focused. So I want to give you four dimensions of this mission focused uh, uh, church that we ought to observe as Paul shared it with us in this passage of scripture. Look with me please at verse 19. And I want you to notice the first passion here is simply passion for God. Passion for God. Look at verse 19 where the first three words of the verse, just the first three words, would you read them with me? Ready? Serving the Lord. Serving the Lord. This is not the first time we've encountered this thought because we find it in Acts chapter 13, verse 2, when the church of Antioch, uh, the Bible says, as they ministered to the Lord, that, God, that the Holy Spirit called missionaries out from their midst. The focus of the church is God. Paul often referred himself to himself as a bond servant of Jesus Christ, a bond slave. And Paul saw ministry primarily as service to God. He identifies himself 17 different times as a servant of Jesus Christ. Not church planter Paul, not a powerful preacher Paul, not mentor Paul, not teacher Paul or preacher Paul, but servant Paul. Because his emphasis was God. The emphasis of the church must be God. Think about what, what motivated Paul in, in 2 Corinthians 5.14. He said he was constrained by the love of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 10.16, he said, I want to preach the gospel in the regions beyond you. In 2 Corinthians 11.28, he talked about the care of all the churches that came upon him. But it all revolved around one passion, one foundational passion, and that was Philippians 3.10, that I may know him. And the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Here's what I want us to see this morning. Here are a couple thoughts under point number one. Passion for God has to be the driving force of ministry. Can I tell you this? If passion for people is the driving force of your ministry, you'll soon quit. Because people will disappoint you. Passion for God has to be the driving force of ministry. It doesn't start with a passion for people. It doesn't start with a passion for souls. This morning in Sunday school, I, I, I began the lesson on prayer with the idea that I'm not going to put you on a guilt trip because you don't, you don't think you pray enough for missions and for the work of the Lord. And, and I have heard sermons that put me on a guilt trip about having a burden for souls. Have you ever heard sermons like that? You, your problem is you don't care about people. Your problem is you don't have a burden for souls. You know how to get a burden for souls? Get a burden for God. You know how to have a passion for each people? Get a passion for God in your heart. If people are your goal, you will falter and fail. But if God is your goal, you can remain faithful. Well, how does Paul describe this in his, his epistles? He says in Galatians 1.10, For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Or I would not be the servant of Christ. 1 Thessalonians 2.4, he said this, But as we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, not, uh, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God, which trieth our hearts. I want you to hear the statement. People pleasing is exhausting. But pleasing Jesus is life-giving. It is life-sustaining. Pleasing God, serving in the ministry for all of us is a call to serve God. It is that He would be pleased with our life. When we have this motivation in our hearts and this passion in our hearts, it reminds us who's in charge. It reminds us we're not doing this for people. I'm not here for you. Uh, that, that sounds kind of mean for coming from a visiting speaker. I'm not here for you. I'm here to please God. And I'm here to preach His Word. And if He's pleased with it, that's all good. I remember as a young pastor, especially, 
I would preach in my church <clears throat> and I would, I would give an altar call. And when I invited everyone to the altar, if they wanted to come, I would kneel behind my pulpit and pray. And I knelt down there time after time after time. And I would say to God, Lord, that sermon stunk. Uh, can, I, can I tell you a funny story? On Wednesday nights after church, we would have prayer time. We'd break up into groups, three or four people. We'd get prayer requests and everybody would pray. And my wife would come down and join me at the altar right here. So Wednesday night church is over. I step down to the altar. I kneel beside my wife. And I said to my wife, boy, I laid an egg tonight. Do you all know what that means? It means it was a bad sermon, okay? And my wife said, your microphone's still on. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I remember, I remember one time I knelt behind my pulpit and I said to God, that was not a good sermon, Lord. I'm sorry. And you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? You're not supposed to use these words. But you know what he said to me? He said, shut up. He said to me, and I, just like I'm talking to you right now, the Holy Spirit said, you studied and you prayed and you faithfully delivered my word. You let me handle the rest of it. And I, I began learning. I'm still learning because we all want to be liked, right? We all want, all want to be uh, thought well of. But I began learning that if God is pleased with the sermon, it doesn't matter if the people are pleased because we're here to serve God. If you, if you teach a Sunday school class or if you clean the building, it's all for the glory of God, isn't it? It's all to please Him. And by the way, if we have this passion, it will cause us to be willing to do anything necessary for the glory of God. So this passion has to be the driving force of ministry. And you know what will happen if we have this passion in our heart? We will become servants to people. Because ministry is always to people. I've, I've read several good books on this subject lately, but I was, I, was, I was listening to a book, audio book, and it said this, ministry is investing in people's lives. Just trying to help people toward God. And listen, when they disappoint you, ministry is investing in them anyway. People will disappoint us. But if our passion is for God and not just for people, we will continue in the work. And it removes something else. This passion does something else. It removes our craving for recognition. We always want to pat on the back. We want to be recognized for our work. But if I'm doing it for him, and you don't say a word, it's okay. Amen right there? That's good stuff, isn't it? It's about God. It's all about God. Now, in verse 19, I want you to see this as well before we go to the next point. There are two attitudes that mark someone with a passion for God. You say, well, how do I know if I'm doing this in, in passion for God or if, if in the recesses of my heart I'm really doing this to be a people pleaser? Notice what he says. <clears throat> Serving the Lord with all humility of mind. I'll tell you how to recognize somebody who's serving with a passion for God. They have a humble spirit. A humble spirit. Paul called it humility of mind. Now, do we have any better example? I talked about this Friday night, I think. But do we have any better example of humility than Jesus? He washed the disciples' feet. Um, the disciples were arguing about who would sit on the right hand and the left hand in the kingdom. And Jesus knelt down and washed their feet. And Paul, despite his position and his accomplishments, he knew his place. He was a servant. Here's what he said about himself in 1 Corinthians 3, 5. Who then is Paul? They were arguing in that chapter, and, and Paul called them carnal. So I'm of Paul, and I'm of Apollos. And he said, well, who's Paul? And who is Apollos? But servants. The Bible's word is minister, same definition. Servants by whom ye believed. <coughs> and can I, can I say this? We've had enough ego in the Lord's work. We've had enough celebrity pastors and celebrity evangelists. What we really need are some humble servants. I want you to hear this statement, please. I want you to hear every statement I say from now on, okay? I'm going to quit doing that. A church full of strife is absent of humble servants. Humble people don't fight each other. And you can know if a person is serving out of love and passion for the glory of God if they're doing it with a spirit of humility. Here's how Paul described himself. He said, I am the least of the apostles. 
you put all the apostles up here on the stage, just put me at the back of the list because I'm just a nobody. He said it like this in Ephesians 3, 8, I'm less than the least of all saints. Put all the Christians you know up here on the stage and put me in the back because I'm the least one. He said in, in 1 Timothy 1, 15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came in the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. I am the least worthy to be in the work of God. But he uses me for his glory and my passion is his glory. If you want recognition and you want promotion and you want position, go climb a corporate ladder somewhere. But if you want to please God, humbly serve in his work and do whatever it takes to bring glory to him through your life. There is another characteristic that marks a a servant who's passionate for God, and that is a willingness to endure suffering. A willingness to endure suffering. Notice what Paul says in the last part of verse 19 here. With many, uh, serving the Lord with all humility of mind. And then he says, and with many tears and temptations which befell me by the lying in wait of the Jews. You know what he's talking about there. He's talking about his suffering. I, I believe there are two kinds of suffering that he's pointing out here. I believe the tears, I'm going to take these in, in reverse order actually. The temptations, I think, refers to the physical suffering that he endured. You see, when, when, when Paul got saved, as soon as he got saved, he began preaching and he had to leave Damascus. Remember, he was led over the wall in a basket. And, he, and then he had to leave Jerusalem because things were getting heated there. And then he went to Cyprus and Antioch and Iconium and Lystra and Thessalonica and Berea and Corinth and Ephesus and on and on and on. And every step of the way, he was persecuted. He was attacked for the proclamation of the gospel. And so Paul suffered externally. He suffered physically. I I read this statement a while back. It says brokenness, and, and this is from my friend Mark Gilmore. He said brokenness, and referring to suffering, is not a mere pers- uh, possibility in a mission-focused life. It is a necessity. When Paul embraced this necessity, he actually came to rejoice in it. He learned to rejoice in it. He said in, in his epistles, who now rejoice in my sufferings for you. He, he said it like this in 2 Corinthians 4, 7. We have this treasure in earthen vessels that the power may be, the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. <coughs> he said this in 2 Corinthians 4, 11, We which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest. We suffer all things, lest we should hinder the gospel of Christ. 1 Corinthians 9, 12. 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. I've already quoted it twice, in, once in Sunday school and just a few minutes ago, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, Philippians 3, 10. I like that part of the verse, don't you? I want to know him, and I want to know the power of the Christian life. But Paul also said, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his what? His death. Suffering, the theology of suffering is a much neglected subject in our churches today. But the necessity of it for the glory of God is, is, is vital. And here's what I'm trying to say to you this morning. One characteristic that you can, you, you can know that you are serving with a passion for God is you're willing to endure hardships for the gospel's sake. If things go if things go tough in your life and you complain constantly, are you, who are you really doing this for? Is, is God being able to manifest His glory through your life and your willingness to be, suffer, uh, to, to be one who suffers? Someone said it like this, Missions is offering my life to be broken so that the light of Christ can be seen by those who otherwise would never see Him. Missions is the willingness to die daily so that others can live eternally. When Paul got saved, the Holy Spirit told Ananias to go minister to Paul. Remember this passage of Scripture in Acts chapter 9? And I I can't find it in the Bible, but I'm pretty sure Ananias said, Can you give me that name again, please? You sure that's the guy that's been killing us? You do know this, right? You want me to go, go to him? And here's what the Holy Spirit said to Ananias. He said, go minister to Paul, Saul, for I will show him 
how, how he must suffer for the gospel's sake, how he must suffer many things. Notice also the word, not just the word temptations, referring to outside or physical sufferings, but notice the word tears, and I call that internal suffering. You won't endure physical suffering unless your mind and your heart are in the right place. And listen to me, this is a powerful statement. You're not really serving God until what's in God's heart is in your heart. You're not really serving Him until what's important to Him is important to you. This is the internal burden of the work of God. In 2 Corinthians 11, when Paul talked about the, the afflictions and the watchfulness and the nakedness and the cold and the hunger and the thirst and the shipwrecks and the beatings and the uh, uh, a night and a day in the deep, he talked about all that outside suffering. And then in the next verse, he concludes with, Besides that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Do you know Paul's biggest burden was the heart he had for the work of God and the glory of God. And that's what this whole first point is about. Passion for God. Paul wept over the lost. He wept over weak, struggling Christians in the church of Corinth. He wept over the threat of false teachers right here in Acts chapter 20, verses 29 to 31. And he cared so deeply for the church, it was a burden he carried in his heart. It was heavy. May I say to you, the pastor of the church ought, ought not be the only one carrying the burden of this work. Every member of this church ought to hurt inside to see God advanced and glorified right here in Mattoon, Illinois. Can I get an amen right there? Number one, passion for God. Number two, passion for God's word. <clears throat> Look at verse 20, please. And how I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and have taught you publicly and from house to house. There is a direct application here to the preacher because the primary task of the preacher is the preaching and teaching of the word to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. But there's a general application here that Paul, I think, is trying to make, and that is that we must have a commitment to and a love for and a passion for the word of God. It is the foundation upon which this church is built. You know, if anybody asks you, why does your church do such and such? The answer ought to be, well, because the Bible says. Why do you live in such a way? Well, because the Bible says. Everything is based on the Word of God, isn't it? It shows a commitment to the Scripture, a passion for the Scripture. And as I mentioned earlier, there's no way Paul could have established the churches he did if he hadn't gone in teaching them biblical principles upon which the church is built. A church may grow because they use fancy methods and they use attractive things to bring in big crowds. But one by one, you look all over our nation and one by one, those churches are imploding because they were built on the wrong philosophy. They were built on the wrong foundation. But a church built on the Word of God will stand in a wicked culture. It will stand where morals are being forsaken and morals are being ridiculed and derided and Christians are being canceled out in our cancel culture. We've got to have a passion for the Word of God. There's two things in this verse where Paul said, <clears throat> publicly I showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house. I, I've heard this verse talked about in, in you ought to go knocking on doors and reaching people for Christ. And that's great. I'm not against that at all. But I don't think this is a verse, is a support verse for that. I think it means Paul says, I, pr publicly, pr sorry, I publicly proclaim the word of God in the synagogues, in the streets. And I came to your house to teach you how to apply scriptural truth to your life and to your family. The primacy of the Word of God is very evident. And Paul is meeting with these leaders of Ephesus, and he's telling them in the future, here's where the church ought to focus, not on building big buildings and not on how to draw a big crowd, but you better focus on God, and you better focus on God's Word. The Bible, you'll agree with me on this, the Bible is a body of truth that we cannot forsake. If we do, we're no longer a church. So if your pastor to get up Sunday and say, you know, I've been here 13 years, right, pastor? <clears throat> I've been here 
about 13 years, and, and I've been preaching the Bible the whole, the whole time I've been here, and we've been taking it very literally, but I've come to the conclusion we're taking it too literal. So we're just going to back off a little bit, and there's some good stuff in here. There's some good principles for your life, so we're just going to approach it with a little differently. We're not going to take the Bible so literal anymore. Now, I don't know you all well and too well, but I think I know you well enough that you would say, excuse me? What are you saying? You're not going to preach the Bible anymore? We would, we would rise up against that, wouldn't we? We wouldn't tolerate that. We'd probably be looking for a new church or be looking for a new pastor or something would have to give. Do you know there's 3,700 languages in the world where there is no Bible to preach from? And, and just as passionate as you are that your pastor lead from this book and this church be governed and founded on this book, we ought to be just as passionate to get the Word of God to people who've never had it. That's my commercial for Worldview Ministries right there. <laughs> Number three, passion for the gospel. Look with me, please, at verse 21. <clears throat> Testifying both to the Jews... And also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. I think that's a summary of the gospel. We repent because we offended God. And we embrace faith in Jesus because he's the one who died for our sins. There's hundreds and thousands of perversions of the gospel. But the pure gospel is the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's how we're saved. And nobody comes to the Father but by Jesus Christ. Amen? So Paul preached the truth. 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 through 23. We won't take the time to read. But he said, I made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Passionate for the gospel. Romans 1, 16, for I am debtor to the, Greeks and the, and, uh, the Jews and the Greeks. I, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, he said, for it's the power of God unto salvation. The devil is the author, and here's what, here's what you know is true. The devil is the author of thousands of distorted views of the gospel. And you know what his goal is? It's to get us arguing about what the gospel really is. As long as we're arguing about what the gospel really is, we're not taking the time to preach the gospel. And number four. We're going to finish up here. Look at verse 22. <clears throat> and let's talk about passion for God's will. And now behold, I go bound in the spirit unto Jerusalem, not knowing the things that shall befall me there, save that the Holy Ghost witnesseth in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions abide me. Verse 22 is the verse God gave me to step away from my 16-year pastorate to follow him into the work of missions. And let me illustrate what this verse is. Paul's expressing here that his biggest concern at this point is to follow the will of God. If you read on in this chapter and you read the next chapter, you'll find out that they were all trying to get Paul not to go to Jerusalem. If you go, the prophet Agabus said he took Paul's belt and wrapped it around his wrist. He said, this is what's going to happen to the man who goes to Jerusalem. Don't go, Paul. The four daughters of Philip prophesied and said, if you go, you're going to die. Don't go, Paul. And he said, I have to follow the leading of the Spirit of God in my life. The, the analogy is a king who goes to war and wins the battle and comes back to his own city with the spoils of war. And they're loaded on these carts being pulled by oxen and we've got gold and silver and all kinds of things we have plundered from the enemy that we just conquered and we're parading these down the city streets in our own town to show what a victory that, that God has given us and behind these carts are prisoners bound and these are the prisoners we have taken in our victory and they can either walk behind the cart or they can be drugged behind the cart but they're coming with the cart that's the analogy Paul is using right here when he says, I go bound in the Spirit. So you don't understand something about me, Paul's saying, I'm going to follow the leading of the Lord. I don't care what it costs me. I don't care where it takes me. I don't care how difficult it is. 
I'm not about preserving my physical health. I'm not about preserving my physical safety. I'm not about keeping my life happy, safe, and secure, and healthy, wealthy, and wise. I'm going to follow the Lord, whatever the cost may be. Say, where do you get that? Well, look at verse 24. They kept saying, don't go, don't go, don't go. And here's what Paul said, but none of these things move me. Neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy in the ministry which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. See, the resolve, Paul was a, Paul was a man, a human, right? You know he didn't walk into suffering with great power and joy and happiness like, oh, you're about to beat me? Oh, good, here, here's my back. Paul was a man. He feared those things. I'm certain he did. But, listen to me, the resolve of his dedication and his spirit overcame his fear of physical safety. There was something more important than his own safety. He was driven to boldness for the glory of God, and passion for God overruled all self-consideration. That's what he says to us in Romans 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. He did face persecution when he got to Jerusalem. He was taken as prisoner to Rome, lived out the rest of his days probably in Rome. It's possible that he made a short journey to Spain, but he gave himself to the will of God without, without weighing the risk. Someone might say, well, you tell me all the risk that's involved, and then I'll tell you if I'm willing to do it. No. Paul said, I'm in. The Spirit of God is leading me, and I'm in. John Payton, missionary to the, New, to the Hebrides Islands uh, over 100 years ago, on his way to the islands on the ship, they're approaching the Hebrides Islands, and he told the captain, there's the island we want to go to. And the captain of the ship said, sir, you know that that island is inhabited by cannibals. He said, yes, sir, that's where we want to go. He said, Mr. Payton, you know if I take you to that island, you're going to be eaten by cannibals. He said, yes, sir, I understand that. That's where we're going to go. He said, I don't think you get it, Mr. Payton. If I take you to that island, you're going to die. And John Payton said, sir, with all respect, we died before we came here. We died before we came here. Can I ask you this morning, do you have passion for God? Is that the ruling emotion of your heart? you have passion for His Word? Is it the most important book in this world to you? And the principles of this book, are they the most important principles on which you should build your life? Are you passionate for the gospel? Have your neighbors ever heard it from your mouth? Do your lost family members know a clear presentation of the gospel? Are you passionate for His will? Will you do what God leads you to do, regardless of what it costs? Would you bow in prayer with me, please? Here's what I would ask you to pray this morning, as I pray in just a moment. <clears throat> would you willingly say to God, whatever you want, wherever you want, for as long as you want, I want to be on mission with you. Whatever you want, wherever you want, for as long as you want, I want to be on mission with you. Our Father, we thank you for the power of your word. What a great passage of scripture from the exhortation of Paul to this Ephesian church. May we take it personally this morning, individually into our hearts, and may we take it corporately as a church. And would you give us passion for you and your word and your gospel and to follow your leading for your will in our lives. May we apply this message as the Holy Spirit has spoken directly to us this morning in Jesus' name.